Hello everyone, this is Rudolf Barasic here back again with another episode together with my special guest, Mr. Jeff Nyquist. Hello Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Rudolf. How are you? I'm very fine. It's always glad to hear to have these topic discussion with you and so on. So now we're gonna focus a little bit on you had a very interesting discussion with someone that was very close or who, who lived during the Soviet Union and worked as a lawyer. And that person can give very good information on the current structure of the system in Putin's contemporary Russia. Please, Jeff, explain a little bit more to everyone tuning in. Well, yeah, um, this is a lady I've, I've known, I've communicated with for some years. She was a, a lawyer uh, under the Soviet Union, she went to law school in, um, starting in uh, 1949, around then, and she, uh, she, she studied to be a lawyer, um, and she actually uh, was at meetings, met Stalin, and heard him speak before groups of law- lawyers and law students back in the early 50s. Um, uh-huh. she, um, she also uh, had interactions with the KGB as a lawyer. She had a career uh, in law in the Soviet Union until she uh, uh, got out of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Um, but uh, qu- quite a long career. And uh, what's really interesting, she knows the Soviet system really well because the, the legal system is a design part of that holds the institutions together. And it's not like the legal system in the West. It is based on completely different concepts. And She had insights into that and insights into things happening here in the West and in Putin's Russia having to do with this design, which she attributes to Stalin. She said Stalin was a kind of genius. And she said, if you if you could hear Stalin speak in person, you would hear a man who is very logical, very clear uh, and 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 had a kind of intellectual charisma. You were you were really persuaded when you listened to him. But she said that if you had discernment, you could also hear a menace. You could hear something evil in what he was saying, um, which ultimately made her kind of a, you could say at that time, a closet dissident. Um, Mm -hmm. And she um, she ended up uh, curiously, she ended up being the the fiance of the man who would become uh, Putin's mentor years later in the 1970s. Uh, she never, she did not marry him, but she <coughs> knew him well for many years, and um, and she she knew this milieu that 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 Putin came out of. And I asked her the question. I said, you know, it has occurred to me watching Putin that Putin consciously imitates Stalin's manners. And I said, is this true? As somebody who's seen Stalin, because we have very few uh, videos of watching Stalin. And she said, oh yes, absolutely. Stalin clearly, I mean, uh, Putin clearly imitates Stalin in his laconic manner of speaking. Um, he, he attempts to, to have this, uh, this persona. Um, and it's clear that the, she said that you cannot really understand uh, today's Russian Federation and Putin if you don't understand the role that Stalin still plays as a model, as the builder of that Soviet system, however much they've changed the system, however much Khrushchev, you know, uh, reformed it or Gorbachev. With the reforms, you know, yes. With reforms, the fall of the Soviet Union and so forth. She said the, the core of the system, the design, the build, he said, she said they cannot get away from it because it would destroy them utterly if they did. And they, the, the smart ones there, they know this. And it's, it's, it was really quite fascinating to hear her describing this and I thought you know I I'd, I'd had you know she said it with such nuance and I've written about this and because I've talked to so many people I've had this idea myself and I was astonished to hear her telling me and telling me more and giving me more affirmation of this intuition that I've had um, from somebody that really knows the system but what was really shocking is she said that this Soviet she called it a Soviet mafia because it's a, she called it a kind of Soviet mafia system because it's really not based on rule of law. It's based on on principles that are not really lawful. <clears throat> uh, principles of power and uh, and and uh, yes. exploiting. If look people. At, if, yes, for instance, if we look at the the, the, 
the structure of the Soviet Union during Stalin era. Now, he was in power from 1922, I believe, up until 1952. That's his reign of power is for Stalin. So it's quite a long time. And we also noticed that it was a very highly centralized system centered on Moscow. And it also embarked on an imperialistic path with taking on all those countries, just expanding the territories more and more and more. Um, um, but what is also quite frightening, I noticed when, when I followed that discussion, a thread, it was, I believe it was on RT. And we noticed that it is also a shift, let's say, after Khrushchev and anti-Stalinist campaigns started. And, and also you were allowed to criticize the nomenclatura and the Politburo. Um, but but now what we're noticing, there are attempts from the, from the Putin government to, to somehow rehabilitate this individual who is one of the worst dictators of humankind, of mankind that we have ever experienced. Please, let me, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I think the call just dropped out for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Okay, very good. Um, Did well, you hear what I said? about the centralization of the system and yes, so on the state? The, the centralization is the key because you see the thing is is that if you want uh, you know freedom, you want decentralized <clears throat> power, you want uh, checks and balances, you want you don't exactly. want power all in the hands of one man, the general secretary <laughs> of the Communist Party. Um, and that's what Stalin did. Stalin created a but also his centralized henchmen. His, his henchmen for his instance, henchmen, are often yeah. Not, yeah his henchmen are not so discussed. You have this yeah. This disgusting figure, Lazar Kaganovich, who was a brutal man, and then Lavren Chiberia and all of them together, and so on, Zhukov, and so on. So you have them all together, this, this, this cadre. Please go on. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, it's all about obedience and subordination. And uh, uh, they make a system where they, they try to get everybody to tell on everybody else. And the first one to run and inform on the other one is the one that ends up surviving or going up the, the ladder. So this mm -hmm. is a very vicious system, I mean, if you think about it. And um, Stalin knew what he was doing when he made it. And I think um, Kotkin, uh, the, the author of the recent Stalin biography, and, and we're waiting for volume three now, I've read the first two volumes, is uh, very clear in his first volume of, of saying, look, uh, nobody but Stalin could have made socialism work. Because the, the, the idea is, is so difficult, it's so uh, that only an evil genius could have designed a system that would not have failed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's basically right. Mm. I think that's right. I think that, you know, that we, we talked before about the Joker uh, in, in, yes. in a previous thing about the movie The Joker. And the, the, the thing is, is that what Kotkin says basically is that uh, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Trotsky, and Bukharin they were communists and they were dogmatists in their own way, but they did not understand uh, how to build a system, a socialist system. They, they, they didn't realize how much murder and how to do the murder and how to do the information war. Uh, exactly. the, the lady explained to me, she said, she said, you know who invented political correctness? And I had always heard, you know, that it was Mao. I hadn't but of course, I knew that all, all communist systems have political correctness, the equivalent of it. She said, actually, it was invented by Stalin. Stalin created the idea of political correctness. It was the, uh, the kernel of the center of the, you know, the, the seed at the center, the, the, the acorn and the oak at the center of the Soviet system, uh, that there was the party line. And you had to toe the party line. And if you didn't toe the party line, you were out. You were, if you, you deviate going, from, from yes. the political party, exactly. You might get penalized and, or, or... And, of course, it was Kamenev and Zinoviev who were the anti-party anti group, right, militating against... And, of course, it was uh, Stalin that made them into the anti-party group because anybody that didn't automatically agree with his plan uh, was doomed, really. Because exactly. it was his way or the highway. And there was not... You know, party democracy was not going to... was only existed in theory. If anybody mm. really exercised party democracy... They were gone. Exactly, uh, and we noticed this with you during the Great Purges, and this uh, and during the Holodomor from 1920. Sorry, from 1932 to 1933, the the genocide that they did against the Ukrainians, the peasants, and so on, the Kolchos and so on. It was heinous crime, and 
on that short amount of time as well. And then you have the gulags, everything that is is written by the, the great Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So we ha- we have it there. But I, well, what I would like to discuss is that parallels how how this woman sees us to 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 contemporary Russia to Putin in regards to well the state's it, policies. Please go on. Yeah, and of course we have Boris Nemtsov now, right? Mm-hmm. If if you had Trotsky, then you have you have Boris Nemtsov, you know, sh- shot down outside the Kremlin wall. Um, it, it's. Uh, the the like the Kirov murder or or other things you you have this same kind of the, the the same sort of principles are in effect that if you're you know people had talked about him as being a you know Boris Yeltsin appointing him as the successor instead of Putin but no he ends up shot dead later you know when it was convenient for Putin um, we have the deaths of so many journalists in Russia. Uh, mm-hmm. Anna Polikovsky is shot outside on the lift outside her apartment. Uh, the dissident Alexander Litvinenko poisoned with polonium. These are just a few. And so many businessmen murdered. Well, I, I should also mention Paul Klebnikov, the American journalist shot dead in Moscow, um, who wrote, uh, who had famously wrote The Godfather of the Kremlin about Boris Berezovsky, got sued by Berezovsky in England and realized <laughs> that, uh, that he had been duped by this KGB general that ran the Kremlin back in the day. And he, uh, he went back to retrace his steps to find out what the real truth was and got gunned down. So that was, that, that sort of, that's in brief, just a, can, a snapshot of, of, of Putin's Russia. Murder is still part of the formula. You know, exactly. We, so we see yeah. those parallels, and I agree. Yeah, I do. Uh, but what is very interesting, let's say, where I, uh, the, the way the way I see it, how the Stalinist view has become part of this public discourse in 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 Russia is is very frightening. It, it is actually chilling. But I believe that it's one of the reasons because Stalin, he is the one who proclaimed successfully socialism in one country. We should abandon the world revolution, like. Uh, like Trotsky discussed and so on, even though they had uh, imperialistic ambitions and so on. But you had some kind of weird culture, culture that you, you mixed uh, civic nationalism along with, uh, with Bolshevism altogether. And this is also one aspect what I see with, with, with Putin and this Putin cult is pre- pretty much the same as it was with the Stalin cult. Please go on. Yeah, it, it is very similar. It's got a similar design. And what's interesting is the way it's connected to uh, the Great War, not the World War I Great War, but the greatest war of all, World War II, uh, what they call the Great Patriotic War in, the, in Russia. Um, you see, Stalin, you had this period of time in Russia after 1991 where people started you know, going into archives and trying to get things out. Now, the archives are still mostly closed, and there was just a brief window of opening there, and they were parceling out archives, and some mm-hmm. of the information that they parceled out was probably false. Some of it was placed in a misleading context. But we, we just have a fragment, fragmentary idea of what's, what the reality is over there regarding World War II. Those, those archives are still closed. They don't let anybody in there to see what, what the truth is. You know, they've, they've shown about some battles and things, but, but we found out that there were whole battles that they lost that they covered up because mm-hmm. they were trying to protect the reputations of various generals like Zhukov. Um, and, it's, it's, and, and, and uh, uh, of course, also uh, <laughs> uh, famously uh, Sokolovsky. Uh, he lost a, a major battle, and they covered that up as well. Uh, and... What's really interesting here, though, is the way the structure of the propaganda and the regime mirrors the structure of the Stalin regime before World War II. And there has been remarks. I found quotations from some contemporary Russian politicians and political observers saying that we are in a pre-war period. Uh, and that that it, it, it reflects the same similar atmosphere to that of the 1930s. And this is an atmosphere of a period where Stalin... With the remembers, exception of uh, nuclear arsenals. But yes, I understand. Right, but arsenal, you know, a, a nuclear weapon is just a grenade with a bigger blast radius. I mean, it's a weapon yes. as a weapon. Um, uh, the targets are bigger now, too. Um, so mm-hmm. anyway, what, what, what was really interesting is, is, is that the way that you have this parallel 
where Stalin had this kind of flirtation with Hitler that ended up in the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. And one of the things Kotkin shows is that Stalin was flirting with Hitler very early on, signaling to him under the table, making little agreements here and there under the table, um, winking and nodding under the table. I think we've been seeing that. And in that this, this, you know, you've got this uh, sort of disinformation uh, agent, uh, Mr. Alexander Dugan, that's, that sort of yes. represents Stalin's, uh, Stalin, Putin's eye winking at the right wing in Europe saying, you know, we're really your, your guy. We're really allied with you. We really support you. Where, where the right in Europe is, is sort of being misled. This is something that, that uh, Stalin, in a way, seduced Hitler and the National Socialist regime seduced them into an alliance that was really not in their interest because that alliance led to the national socialism ending up in a war with the West, with France and Britain and ultimately America. And this was all to Russia's advantage until Hitler woke up at the last minute and realized he'd been tricked and, and came for Stalin. But uh, here again, you have this attempt to use the right by Moscow. And in this sense, quite remarkably, Putin is following in Stalin's uh, footsteps. Um, yeah, it, yes. it, it, is, it is something. Uh, because Stalin yeah. did this too. Uh, the zigzag path, by the way, which Gorbachev in his book Perestroika uh, lionizes, he said that the, the revolutionary path is not a straight line. It's a line that keeps changing. You know, the mm. party line, whatever it is you're supposed to say or do openly, that's going to change. And he called it a zigzag path. And that it certainly has been. And zigging and zagging means you're going to the right, you're going to the left, you're tacking, which is exactly okay. how Kotkin <clears throat> describes Stalin's career in the 1920s. He tacks to the right. Then in 1929, he tacks to the left and says, oh, I was never against collective farming. We just didn't have the strength for it. Mr. Bukharin's not a real socialist, you see. And, and exactly. so all of a sudden, Kamenev and Zinoviev were right, but their timing was wrong. You see, that's why they had to be eliminated. So it's a zigzag path always to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. Um, and, and also, if you look at foreign policy wise, they're, they're shifting more towards this Euro Asianism that we, you and I have discussed in also previous shows. And we noticed also this typical KGB policy of conduct that you support one side and you support the other. So you make just everyone becomes so confused of the policy. They just do it to enrich themselves and, and emerge victorious. So we see that policy too being being implemented by Miss, Mr. Putin and his cadres and so on. Uh, the only thing that I just see that it, there's a problem with this system is that we live in a different world right now. I can see the features that are quite similar. I absolutely agree with that. But see, but but we also see more more uprising, more this grassroots movement taking on more nationalistic turns. And this might actually like create another perestroika. You and I, we have discussed this too in the past, and this might actually signify the end for the Putin cult and the Putin reign, I would say. What do you say? Well, they're very adaptive. They can, they can come up with a new... Uh, you know, uh, somebody once made the comment that Mao reinvented himself over and over again. So did Stalin with his... Uh, dissolving the common turn in May 1943 with uh, the Stalin Constitution in 19 what was it 37 or 36, uh, he had uh, he had NEP he went along with and then he reversed NEP and did collectivized farming. I mean, the, the Soviet regime and its leadership were <laughs> always reinventing themselves, yeah. and this is part of that tacking left and right, and it's like breathing. So uh, uh, Edward J. Epstein uh, uh, said that this is a regime that breathes in and out. And that, that when it does any NEP, it's taking in air. And then when it does collective farming, it's exhaling. And right. then, it breathe, then it has to breathe again. So then it liberalizes and then it tightens up and then it liberalizes and tightens up. But I think the, the, this uh, uh, Russian lady uh, that I was talking to, she had a, a, a really interesting insight. She said that, mm -hmm. the, the, that the Stalin mafia, the social Soviet ma mafia, uh, didn't just exist in Russia, that, that he, of course, made the other socialist countries in that same image with that same design, but also the communist parties around the world and the subversive socialist mafia in, in every country. 
that was underground, excuse me, <coughs> that was underground, these mafias, um, they retained this Stalin character and used those Stalin tactics. And she made a comment about the impeachment of Trump. Very interesting. I said, well, what do you think of Schiff and Pelosi and so on? And she said, oh, well, they're part of the Stalin's Soviet mafia. And I said, you mean literally? She says, I mean literally. But how, how, how does she make that connection? In, in, I mean, empirically speaking, because to tie in Pelosi and Schiff and so on into this grand scheme, it, it becomes a little bit... You know, many people would go against that and say, you know, where are, where are the proofs in that sense, please? You know, I've had this sense for a long time, you know, following it. I, I wrote the article about Diana West's red thread, and there's the, yes, yes. the very interesting Ed Baumgartner tweet, where ba Baumgartner, you know, basically chastises um, the, the famous talk radio show host Dennis Prager, for saying that the U.S., the Western press, is more dangerous than Putin's Russia, and he, and he said he said, oh, you probably think you know Putin's Russia is a is a right wing Christian paradise, but it's anything but, you know. And so he's talking like, well, you know, Putin's Russia is really left wing, not right wing, and it's not really a Christian paradise. It's really the socialist motherland still, and you just don't know it, you stupid right winger. And and he's kind of and Baumgartner is one of the <coughs> in, intimates of Nellie Orr yeah. and the people that made the 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 dirty dossier on Trump, you know, the the fusion GPS people, and um, and so you you have this one of the gang making this tweet that's kind of a confession that's saying that Russia is really the socialist motherland and that's who we're working for and we know it, and it's really astonishing to see this tweet because it's you know and and Diana reproduces it in the book, uh, in her book uh, which is. Um, the red thread, which shows a red thread running through it. And you see, when, when uh, I, I, I talked to the, this Russian lady who was a lawyer in the Soviet Union, I, I said, well, well how, do you, how do you get there? And she said, well, because I lived in the system so long, I can recognize them by the way they act, by their tactics. She said, this business, she said, what really gives them away, she said, Stalin once said, that you must, that communists must never admit to any crime, doing anything wrong. And, in, and instead, whatever they have done that is considered wrong, they must accuse their enemies of doing that exact same thing. She said, Stalin actually said this. And I, 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 I trust her because she, she lived there. She knew she was this law student. And, and law is about, you know, what people do that's wrong. And so this, uh -huh. she said, that when you look at Pelosi and you look at Schiff and you look at the accusations against Trump and this whole Ukraine ordeal with Biden and, and whatnot, she said that, that at every step of the way, whatever they're doing wrong, they immediately accuse Trump and his campaign or his administration of doing it. For example, well, Trump, when yes, they, yeah, please go yeah. yeah, here's a very obvious thing. You say, oh, it's, it's so shocking. Trump got help. And, and to get dirt on Hillary Clinton by the Russians, you know, going to hack their emails. Oh, mm -hmm. but wait a minute. You mean the dirty dossier, which was provided by the Russians, right? And how do you get mm -hmm. information about whether Trump is, I'm, I'm sorry for children listening, it, w whether Trump is peeing on prostitutes in his room? That would only oh, be yes. the KGB that would have that knowledge, right? So are you getting your information directly from Putin's, you know, Putin was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB. You're, you're getting it directly from them. So wait a minute. It's okay for the Democrats to get uh, dirt on, on Trump from the Russians, but it's not okay uh. for Trump to get dirt from the Russians on them. And, and so exactly. he, get, he get, for him it's a crime, for them it's a virtue. You see, this is what Putin taught them, to make their crimes into virtues and those same cri crimes done by their enemies into crimes, real crimes, of which they yes. must pay with their lives. And so uh, this lady, this Russian lady, you know, explained this to me. And she said, if you, wherever you see this, you're seeing them because no other politicians, no other people in the world behave like this. No others, you, it's infallible. This is their method. So when you see this being used, and, and that's just one example. I mean, I mean, this whole thing where Biden is, is basically bribing the government of Ukraine, President Poroshenko, and, and mm -hmm. strong arming him to stop the prosecution. <coughs> Yes. And 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 also to get dirt on 
Trump if they can. And then, of course, and, and Trump is under attack. His lawyer goes to Ukraine, wanting to meet with officials there, finds out about this dirt on them. And no, that's illegal. Trump's lawyer should be locked up, right, for doing something inappropriate, for investigating them, you know, so that it's exactly you criminalize the opposition, basically, in principle. And people are too dumb. Stalin realized that people are too dumb to recognize that this is what's going on, that that every yep. time you say gotcha, that you say, oh, I just caught you in a lie. You go, no, you're the liar and I got you. And then people get yep. really confused. And then you just say it's stronger and you have the whole media behind you and you control. See, Stalin didn't do this until he controlled the intelligence services, the police and the and the um, the judges in Russia, the courts. And then, yeah. of course, he could he could dispose of them how he wanted. And we're reaching that point here because these judgments, these courts. I mean, first of all, Hillary Clinton committed a felony when she she went on a private email server with her official uh, diplomacy emails. I was having lunch with the former DIA general when the news came across and and it was said what those what some of those how those emails were rated. And he said, well, those are secret. She can't put those on a private. I mean, it was right there. He knew, but they just lied and denied it and yes. they covered it up. So the, the thing is, is they could commit murder in broad daylight, commit all mm -hmm. kinds of crimes. There's years later, there's no accountability, but it's it's hang Trump, hang Trump, impeach Trump, you know, and and how many of his exactly. of Trump's friends now and associates have been put in jail or are facing, you know, sentences because of process crimes. They misspoke in their FBI statements and, and remembered differently another time. All right, it's perjury. You're dead. That Hillary Clinton, they wouldn't even make her take an oath before they took her testimony in the email scandal so that she couldn't commit. Well, she wasn't under oath, so she didn't commit perjury. Right? Yes, I, I, I agree. I just want to weigh in here a little bit because we have had these discussions before, and, and, and I believe, just like you said, that we see some structures from the Bolshevik revolution when 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 bolshevism was established uh, when, when they came to power basically and we see this structure following it has not they the russians have not been able to fully liberate themselves from this this heritage it's still strong affecting the the the, the system in, in 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 contemporary russia as well now what i see is the the geopolitical problem of russia is that we see it that russia is siding with the chinese to conspire against the united states and against europe and this goes hand in hand with this euro asian empire building process that the russian and especially the putin the putin government has has embarked on and this is causing huge problems throughout the West. And this for many people, when they they should have noticed this many national, because we, we, we have discussed this in the past, that people that are nationalists or even conservatives and so on, they tend to praise Putin and so on. And, but this should have been an eye opener when in, in 2014, when just the Russian invaded Crimea and just the, the, the ruthless policy that it conducted towards Ukraine. This should have been an eye opener then that something is going very wrong in, in regards to Russian behavior. So that's my take on this. So we have not seen a full liberation. From that sentence, we see also the geopolitical alliance between Chinese, the Chinese and the Russians, and this can cause turmoil. Please go on. Yeah, you can. It, you know, it's it's very interesting when a country invades another country when it has, with the with the Budapest Memorandum, given a guarantee that Ukraine's borders would be respected, and how the exactly. Russians can argue their way around that. It's very odd because Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange yes. for this guarantee from the Russians. And of course, Obama, as the president of the U.S., did not honor the agreement, and the British government didn't, because it couldn't do it without American support. And there was the, the sanctions that Obama, one, one expert uh, wrote in her book that uh, the, the so-called sanctions that Obama put on Russia for the invasion of Crimea were actually an invitation to more aggression because they were nothing. And when yeah, so passive, uh, total passive, uh, totally passive. passive. When 55 yeah. high government officials in the U.S. signed a petition asking Obama to put real hurt on the Russian economy, he he just turned his back on it. He would have nothing to do with it. 
uh, Obama did not want to do anything to Russia. Uh, because Obama was trained by uh, Frank Marshall Davis in his youth, and Davis was a Communist Party USA card-carrying member, and his FBI file says that he was probably a KGB agent. He was caught taking pictures of warships in Pearl Harbor, uh, I think, in the late 50s. So, uh, so this, is, this is the thing people have to understand. Th this is continuous, this war that we're in. The enemy doesn't change from being the enemy just because he takes down this, the USSR sign and puts up the Russian Federation sign. The KGB changes its name to FSB, and it doesn't change its nature. You know, if, if, you, if you take uh, uh, Charlie Manson and you say, well, his name is now Charlie Brown, it doesn't change him from the psychopath yeah. that he was. His, his inner only, nature yeah, remains. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, but we, we, we have this problem, and, and I would say that it, 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 this needs to be scrutinized like we're doing on this show and so on. Uh, there are... Now, I know that... I want people to comment. I don't want people to, to stay away from comments. I want people in the country to comment as much as possible and so on. Uh, I, I noticed that there was one comment from one guy who, who wrote about Trump and so on, that Trump uh, was not so, uh, that, 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 that Trump is not an outsider, that he was actually backed by, by very influential people and so on. And I would say I have to agree with what this guy said in, in that sense. Because I believe that this Sheldon Adelson, this casino tycoon, and other bankers did in fact support Trump and so on. So he's not a total outsider. But then again, I also want to say that I do not believe that there is any other political alternative right now. Maybe this beautiful woman, Tulsi Gabbard, she would really go through great lengths to end these illegal and costly wars in the Middle East and in, 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 in Afghanistan. And I think that is something good, but she is off the radar right now. So and also in regards to someone, someone challenging the media and also going against the mainstream media and also going really trying to do his best to 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 slow down on this mass migration that is flooding in from central america i think trump is doing the best so i don't see any other alternative at this very moment please jeff go ahead well you know the idea that trump look just because somebody gives you money and helps you doesn't mean that they own you and a person like trump is clearly not a person you can own he is, um, no, but he was, he was, uh, there are indications, and it's not a speculation, but he was clearly indebted and, and was almost, uh, uh, he, he would do through his real estate uh, business and so on, and he did receive some support from, from very influential bankers and so on, and I don't believe that it's a myth, I do, we need to, to pay special attention uh -huh. to this, and, and I want us to dig into this, but, but I believe that Regardless of this, you have to be, let's say, if you want to enter American politics, it's virtually impossible for anyone well, yeah. having no kind of well, capital look, uh, backing to enter politics. Look, uh, Please go ahead. The amount of money that Hillary Clinton spent dwarfed the amount of money that, that, uh, that uh, he had. And he used some of his own money. And he oh, borrowed to be heavily. Honest, I just wanna... yeah, yeah, my take on this would be, my take on this would be that we have seen these this, this influential bankers and so on, especially, let's say, within JP Morgan, within the Goldman Sachs, they contribute. It's not uncommon for them to, to, to support both sides of the Right, of course. Yeah. Of course they yes. do. Because, because look, yeah. and the thing is, is that it doesn't, it doesn't, you have to look at Trump's character. You have to study him as a personality. Trump is a person that you do not control him. You can pay him and you'll go, why doesn't he stay paid? Why, did, why can't I bribe him? You can't. He is not. Look, if he was dirty, they would have him already. And it's amazing how honest he must be because they have done everything, lifted under every rock. They have tried to find somebody to something to hang him with. I mean, there's never been a more uh, vilified, hated person in American politics. If they had anything on him, he would be gone already. I mean, look at Nixon. Nixon had to resign. And, and, and look, it's, it's impossible that this guy is, is dirty and they haven't found it yet. It's just impossible. And if you look at his character, he's a guy that when you say something to him, he wants to say the opposite. It's just part of his nature. He's like a little kid. No, you but know? I think I think you have made very good points. We noticed it when he kicked out this uh, Bolton. 
And also when he, he, he restrained himself from going to war with Iran, which is fantastic. And I, I, like you and I have discussed with this, surely no other president in, in, in his shoes would have done that. No, no, so, no. So it and, was that's very, he's, and that's yeah, why he's so hated we see, by and the also, establishment. Yeah. And for, furthermore, I want to, this is very important. The discourse that, that he is utilizing is going against this the, the established paradigm Especially we noticed this in his attack against this mainstream media, and this is something that I respect him a lot for. So we need to follow him and see what will happen. So I don't want to disavow him. Yeah, please go ahead. Well, this this Russian lady basically was telling me that we have a proto-totalitarian Soviet system here. And I think that that system is, you know, we've discussed what the Soviet system really is, state capitalism, and it's a form of mercantilism or crony capitalism, where the state... Uh, leadership to, uh, hands out the 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 businesses to their friends to to loot and and to make the lucrative killings off of, so that it's the this party elite this um, this ruling group, you know that yeah. really uh, feeds at the trough and everybody else just simply lives at a very low level, and this is how they do it. And this is what we find in all the socialist countries. They're just bleeding the people white. You know, it's very ironic that communism, which claims that it's going to liberate the people from the capitalist exploiters, are, are 10 times worse than the capitalist exploiters. Capitalism actually ra has raised the standard of living of people in the West. But the more the West moves towards that system, towards state control, towards socialism, as, as they have built it, basically state capitalism, the, the, the standard of living, the growth, everything gets, gets thrown down. And the bankers become, you know, the oligopolies become, you know, are merging with the state. And, and it's, it's basically going to end up in this kind of system if, if somebody doesn't turn it around, if somebody doesn't create more freedom. And I think that that's what, you know, Trump is kind of, uh, I would argue that Trump is a, uh, an, an outlying event, an outlier event that's totally unexpected, that nobody saw coming that comes into the mix and says, no, yeah, I'll take your money. No, I'm not going to do that for you. Oh, I can do a few things for you here, but I'm not going to, you know, he has these principles. He's going to follow uh. them. And it's, it's for a guy that, you know, you don't think of him as a highly ethical person, but like I pointed out before, calling back the, the strike on Iran, not wanting to get into wars. Yes. I heard him at the Minneapolis speech last night. I don't know if you heard it at all. But he was talking about greeting these coffins coming back. And you could tell he was genuinely moved by the, by the agony of the parents, seeing these coffins with their children who mm. fought in these wars and thinking, I, I don't want this. I don't want people to die over there. These people have been fighting each other over there for hundreds of years. Why do we need to be involved in this? It exactly. And sense. we noticed this also with the troop removal from northeast Syria and so on. So, yes, yes. Yeah, and I, I really resent, as an American, foreigners saying, oh, you Americans, you stole the oil, you fought for the oil. No, we've got the biggest oil production in our country, in the world. We didn't take their oil. We paid $8 trillion to rebuild those countries and to fight for those countries, and now we're leaving. Uh, we lost mm. $8 trillion. Well, what, can, what possibly could have we got out of those, I'm sorry, armpits? Nothing, and also the, 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 gas and the, low, the gas and the oil prices were much cheaper before the war as well. So the market was totally against I mean, having. It, yeah, gas. it was. It was. There was no. We didn't do it for imperialistic profit reasons. We didn't do it for those see, reasons. See, there, uh, exactly. You no, know, I, I re, yeah, and it, it's misguided. Is, this misguided idealism for making democracy and regime change. This is just totally wrong. Yeah. And also yeah, the influence from other parties and lobby groups and so on. You have to, we have to take this into consideration as, as well. I believe that a state needs to, a, a state as, as for instance, a powerful state, a great power is the United States, it needs to pursue a policy in accordance with its strategic and national interest. And all of these wars has been costly and negative and not benefited the United States whatsoever. Yeah. So, so we need and, to just end these wars and so on, yeah. please. Yes. And, and Trump is ending it, and he's pulling the troops back. And oh my gosh, the criticism he's getting for this. Um, yeah. But you know what? The people like it. They're tired of this. This didn't make sense. I mean, what? We've been in Afghanistan for more than 17, no, for more than 18 years now in Afghanistan. We've uh -huh. been in Iraq for 16 years now. This is ridiculous. 
Mm. This is totally ridiculous. All we're doing is policing those countries. Come on, this was a this you at some point you got to pack it up and say, well, this was a mistake. You know, this wasn't this isn't helping us. And 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 tr Trump said it. He says those places are more of a mess now than we went in. I mean, he's just Thanks. calling it like he sees it. And of course, all these uh, policy wonks, all these experts, all of them, you know, oh no, you can't say that. You can't, you know, this thing that's been driving U.S. policy. These so-called experts. Um, it's it's they're done. And you know what? You're right. Every except for Rand Paul, who was also running for president in 2016, except for Rand Paul, the only two up there that were going to pull the troops back were going to be Trump and Rand Paul. Those were the only two. Mm. The rest of them. But then you have also this lady who is fantastic. I like her a lot, but she's she like gathers. a man. Yeah, she's off the radar right now. Yeah. I well, they, the, think, the, the, the Democrats, you know, Hillary Clinton was promising a no-fly zone in Syria, which would have probably meant war with Russia. I mean, that's madness. <laughs> yes. yeah, that's insane. Yes, exactly. That would, you know, yeah, I, that's, you know. Yeah, that, I, you know I what, what I secret back deal with Putin did she make so that Putin could sink an aircraft carrier? I wonder. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm wondering. But what is where yes, and we we need to uh, see also what will happen with this troop removal. I am very worried that another mid that, that another drone attack will happen on on let's say Saudi Arabia or something that pushes the U.S. in another meaningless war, not benefit benefiting the United States whatsoever or the Europe, so or or, or Europe whatsoever. So well, we and and see, we we were talking earlier about my Russian lawyer lady friend, Soviet yes. lawyer lady friend, talking about the Putin pattern. What was the what uh, with the Stalin pattern and Putin following it, what was also the Stalin pattern was getting the West involved in a war, a war with Germany and a war with Japan, by the way, because the Russians had their hand in Pearl Harbor as well. Uh, but they were as, fighting as, even even prior to this uh, against uh, the, 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 the Japanese. Well, they were getting Japan involved in a war with China. Yeah. So, you know, the, the whole thing was was, you know, so getting their enemies involved in, in these wars. Oh, you know, mm. not looking at them anymore. Oh, good. They're not going to hurt the Soviet Union. They're all fighting each other. And this is what they've got going with us. And I mean, we fell for this. 9-11, we fell for it. We went into these wars. I mean, where were the Russians fighting? Afghanistan, right? Who was Russia's satellite? You know, satellites were both fighting each other in Iraq and, 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 and uh, Iran. I mean, so we step in there and we, we take over the fighting. I mean, that was insane. Exactly. You had all those neocons that were also somehow connected to Russia and so on, and they shifted their attention to, towards Afghanistan. You noticed it within the George W. Bush administration, so you have the connection there too. Why start a fight in Afghanistan? So yes, so um, yeah, you, have, yeah, you, it, have these, you have these connections, and it started from the Reagan administration, the infiltration and so on. I agree. Yeah, there's, I, and I think people, you look, People should not be naive. If you read Diana West's book, American Betrayal, it's about how many Soviet agents were in uh, the U.S. government before and during and immediately after World War II. It's astonishing. They basically, they basically were making policy. You had uh, uh, Roosevelt's co-president, Harry Hopkins, was supposedly Agent 19, if you accept the analysis. Uh, Agent 19... Uh, basically uh, doing everything in his power to make sure that Russia was coming out ahead in the war. And then, of course, the idea that now today that both the Democrat and the Republican parties are not both infiltrated. Look, we have right-wing voices in Europe that are uh, looking to Moscow. We have Patrick Buchanan here in the U.S. We have uh, many people who are secretly agents of the Russians and the exactly. Chinese. On both uh, sides of the aisle, and this is exactly. extremely dangerous. I cannot say how dangerous this is. Exactly, and I just want to. I mean, my concluding re remarks on this would be that the United States should should pursue a foreign policy designed to just benefit its national and strategic strategic interests, and not getting involved for in any for anyone else except for the, having this good connection with Europe. My concern is also in the future that the United States will will a little bit because we see the European Union is 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 integrated within this U.S. grand scheme. We see that because and it has had a pacified 
let's say, relation on Germany. So I really want to see Germany build up its political and also, in the end, its military capability because it is a good political power with good, uh, a good economic engine and it has the potential to become a political power as well. So I want to see Germany uh, prosper as well. And uh, and also that the United States, you know, embarks on a path, not maybe an isolationist path, but just looks after its strategic interests and do not care for other powers except for uh, itself. That's my take well, on Well, yeah, if you, you can't cheat an honest man, don't get suckered into some idealistic crusade in some dark exactly. corner of the world. Uh, because it's, it's you know, look, the U.S. is responsible for the balance of power between great powers. And this is this balance has gone out of whack. The Russians and Chinese are at a tremendous advantages now. Uh, I think I've mentioned that this uh, paper came out from the U.S. Navy saying we cannot really con seriously contest the South China Sea with the Chinese, and that puts the Philippines, it puts uh, exactly. Singapore, it puts all these, you know, Australia even at risk. Exactly. So we notice this configuration of power. In, in, in geopolitics, it, it, it creates, it, it will actually start a security competition. So, so it is a very shaky international system, I would say. So, so absolutely, it's, it was a very good point. This configuration of power is, is very dangerous, military speaking. Yeah. And also we, we, what will happen with the global economy, depending on if, if we enter another financial crisis and so on, it might actually kick off a war. I hope it will not. But we have to pay attention to these uh, parameters, absolutely. But yeah. Jeff, uh, I'm, as always, I am very f good. You want to? Uh, do you want to add anything more on this subject? No, I I think we covered it. I think we covered it very good, and I want people to please continue to comment. Uh, uh, just uh, hit the like button. Please subscribe and let us know the topics you want us to discuss and so on, and nothing is taboo. We just need to be a little bit careful because we notice that there is a, a, we saw a purge going on against silencing dissidents, especially on the right side of the spectra and so on. So we need to be a little bit careful what we utter and so on. But overall, we want to have a good debate and discuss many subjects as, as much as we can. But uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And Jeff, once again, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And let's speak again quite soon, okay? All right. Thank you. Great.